and we're going to make a major change to the world that we live in um, in terms of physics, magic, religion, biology, science, whatever you guys want to do. Um, and I, I'm going to pitch this one to either Maria or Jay to pick a change at least 2,000 years ago or come up with something super dramatic for how the world functions. I have to think on this one because I, I had I had so many nexus situations planned, but um, give me give me give me ten seconds. Okay. Or I can come up with something too. Um, two thousand years ago, at least. I w I was thinking something like um you know in Let's China. See. Um. So when did they develop the gunpowder? Like you know mm -hmm. having. Gun okay, so do we want? Or Jay, you know, you said you had. Well, we might be able to do both. Jay, what's your idea? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear. I'm having a hard time hearing Maria. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, so Maria's suggestion was, what if um, China had developed gunpowder significantly earlier? Oh yeah, we we yeah we that yeah that's 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 like a quick book. That's, that's <laughs> we not even do we not even doing this show. <laughs> like yeah, this, this that's a wrap. So, so, but that doesn't really. So, that is still kind of a nexus point thing. So, is there anything else that we want to add to that about like why they were able to develop gunpowder? Oh, uh, the emperor did not unite China. They were still the what eight warring states, seven warring states. Uh, um, yeah. Do you want to bring in any uh, speculative elements into that of oh, fantasy? Oh. Yeah. Well, see now, my the one I know really well like keith was going on about this guy who i never heard of in <laughs> something or other what my expertise for history is like 2000 years ago the uh, terracotta warriors were mm -hmm. built and and buried underground to protect the emperor mm -hmm. in the afterlife so okay speculative element well what if the creatures in the afterlife started coming into our real world is that a is that an oh okay yeah let's yeah, yeah cool. we can work with it. oh wow okay, so those warriors maybe those warriors come to life or something like that or there's a way to get them to to fight you know there's there's more to it than okay so two thousand years ago the afterlife starts bleeding into the real world uh initially in the form of the terracotta warriors um but we'll see where things go from there so. Um, 2,000 years ago, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna put Maria in the hot seat for this one. Um, would China initially change significantly? Well, yeah, because instead of fighting each other or fight or they would have to be fighting the, the what's bleeding into there because they're the the entry point, you know, for these creatures coming in and. Um, Oh, I think Maria froze a little bit. So oh, sorry. there she is. I think we'd be more focused on, they would be more focused on internal things. And maybe, uh, I know the Great Wall was built somewhat during that time, but I, I think like they, they wouldn't be as into expanding. They would be more focused inward to try and counter this threat. Oh, I just made sort of like, it's almost like the virus. <laughs> 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 yeah, because that started in China and it spread throughout the world. <laughs> well, Two thousand years ago, we had this these alternate dimension creatures coming in, or the after the uh, afterlife coming in, and they're they're trying to fight it off. Okay, so let's let's keep playing with that. This is wild. This is like some yeah. Game of the Thrones after, type stuff. <laughs> if the afterlife has started to bleed into the real world, so another specific question is: Is it only the Chinese version of the afterlife? Is is every version of every afterlife across the planet like bleeding into the real world? And if that's been going on, um, what do things look like about two hundred years ago? Um, you know who. Does North America still look the same? Um, North America and South America are easy to play with because of the colonization issues. Um, but then how does pretty much every society uh, still function in terms of sociology, in terms of gender dynamics, 
Um, what does technology look like if we've been fighting a war against the afterlife for however long? Well, I, I, well, I think the afterlife is going to outnumber the people who are alive because people keep dying. Yeah. That's that's a good question. <laughs> I, I think I think marijuana and psychedelic drugs will be legalized at that point because <laughs> people have to deal and uh, mental health counseling would be very serious. Yeah. So yeah. Also, funeral rights would be different. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, and would there be different factions who have made peace with the afterlife um, and kind of worked out some sort of communication strategy? I think two th like thousands of years would be a long time to just kind of function on the kill on site method. Yeah. Um, well, there might be like special units of people, like soldiers that are trained specifically to fight so there might be like a front line and while the rest of society kind of functions norm somewhat normally it's sort of like a distant war or distant maybe that that would occur or maybe there would be people who want to join in the afterlife and like they had to be like put on suicide watch because they knew that you know they wanted to turn you know go to the other side or something like that that would be interesting so if we were writing a contemporary alternate history uh, that took place in 2020, would this change have even devolved into being like kind of like a secret world fantasy issue where uh, the main character gets tapped to join this special unit? Oh, by the way, we've been fighting this secret battle against the afterlife. Or would this still be something that everybody knows about and everybody has to deal with? Here's and a thought. That just occurred to me. If if it is if if we're thinking the second that it's something that everybody uh, knows about, this would change a lot of people's approach toward killing. Mm. Because if you kill somebody, then they automatically become part of the other side of the war, which might. This whole thing started with talking about the early invention of gunpowder, but I think it would might go the other way around. Um, is that guns would be severely frowned upon that that the weapons of choice for most people would be blunt weapons that would only injure and not kill hmm. precisely because you're trying to avoid killing people and if um if if humanity's really like functional relationship with death has changed um religion would probably yeah. also look very different right people would probably tithe more maybe i don't know or tithe less who knows you know, whether would the church still have all its power? Would the different religions have have achieved uh, ascendancy? Well, the, the ones that adjust to the new reality would survive, and the ones that don't wouldn't, which is how it's yeah. always been with religions. That's what it's always been. Well, yeah. What about since you know what the afterlife entails? Yeah. It's not like, you know, there's, you know exactly what you're to expect. So that might alter society in that they might not be following a more moral uh, vein because it doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person in this world, you're still going to that afterlife. So hmm. that might change yeah. how things occur. The ones, the religions that other, we might not be killing each other, but there's a lot of other bad things that people can do. And then maybe um, our, our medical system would be really good at keeping people alive. You know, maybe mm. the technology to extend <sighs> life would would work, and maybe we would have very old people who can no longer function physically. Maybe we just stick them in a special tank that just keeps them alive because we don't want them to become soldiers on the other side. Right. That would be really cool. So the race for immortality. Yeah, like yeah. sort of like wow, you're alive forever, but you're not really there. Like you're, you're yeah, if you're your mind has pretty much crumbled, but, but you're still not on the other side yet. So we're going to keep you alive as long as possible. Yeah. Which, you know, which, lots, yeah, you can, there's lots you can do with that. Yeah. So yeah, just motivation to, to improve medical technology for that reason too. Right. Right. Just to and they're just, alive. depending on what type of story you want to tell, depending yeah. on what type of character you want to feature, there are just so many different things that you can play with. Um, based on just this one premise change. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be any 
type of story. So that's why I like going through these exercises because they show that uh, pretty anybody can come up with an alternate history. Uh, you guys did a great job. Um, I'm gonna spend like two minutes going through the rest of my presentation so you guys can stay on screen and then I will invite you guys to talk for a minute or two. Um, so if anybody else is interested in learning more about uh, alternate history. These are some additional resources. Um, the book that I quoted at the very beginning, The Alternate History, Refiguring Historical Time, um, which is by Karen Hellickson. Uh, there's some great collections of essays called The Collected What If. Um, a website called uchronia.net is basically just a massive list of alternate history books organized by uh, at what point um, the change occurs. Um, and then there are channels on YouTube that talk about this, and there are even four um, subreddits um, on Reddit specifically dedicated to alternate history. Um, uh, and a lot of them, it's really cool, people will post pictures of maps and then just talk about how they got to why this map happened. Um, so there's lots of really cool stuff um, and resources out there for you to mine for your own story ideas. Um, my books uh, are alternate history. Uh, they fall into the true alternate history camp. Um, the, the general premise of mine is that the supernatural exists and everybody has always known about it. So the world um, and society and countries look very different. Um, uh, I do play with time travel and steal time, but again, the time travel has nothing to do with the alternate history and it doesn't create any alternate histories. I just really wanted to write a time travel book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, these are all the different places you can find me online if you ever want to chat more. Um, I'm on all of the social medias um, and there will be a uh, PDF version of this presentation up on my blog, uh, jlgribble.com within the next day or two. And then I also, uh, I write lots of book reviews and then I also blog pretty regularly at speculativesheet.com. And that's it for the presentation part. I'm going to kill the screen. And uh, I would like to give uh, my lovely panelists a couple minutes to talk about their projects, whether they, they're writing any alternate histories, maybe. Uh, and then we will open it um, to general Q&A for everybody. Uh, Keith, go ahead. Uh, I'm. Currently, uh, I've got two collaborative novels coming out this year. Neither of them are alternate history, unfortunately. Uh, one is a military science fiction novel that I wrote with David Sherman, which is called To Hell and Regroup, which will be out any day now from Eastbeck Books. Um, it's the third book in a trilogy. David wrote the first two books, and I edited them for him when they were first published. For various health reasons, he was unable to finish the book, so we worked together to finish it. Um, I've got a thriller coming out at the end of this year, which I, which I wrote with uh, Dr. Munish K. Batra, which is called Animal, which is about a serial killer who targets people who harm animals. Um, and I'm also working on the next two books in my two fantasy series. Um, uh, one is uh, uh, the, the Adventures of Brom Gold, which is an urban fantasy that takes place in uh, contemporary New York, where there are... Um, uh, uh, Brahm is a supernatural hunter for hire uh, who lives and works in the Bronx, which is where I'm from. And uh, because people always write about New York City, and whenever they write about New York City, it's really Manhattan south of 125th Street. Um, there's an entire whole rest of the city around, and uh, so I write about that because I think it's more interesting. Um, and uh, so, so Brahm works and uh, lives in the Bronx, and uh, the first book came out last year called The Furnace Sealed. Next book will be out soon, uh, tentatively titled Feet of Clay, uh, Feet, F-E-A-T, um, because I love puns. And then I'm also doing the next in my precinct series, which is a fantasy police procedural. Uh, it's kind of Law and Order meets Lord of the Rings, or Dungeons and Dragnet, as one reviewer called it. Um, <laughs> but it started with Dragon Precinct, and there have been five novels. The sixth novel will be called Phoenix Precinct, and I'm hoping to have that out early next year, also for me, Spain. And I've got, oh, and um, there's a, an anthology that just came out, which I have to mention, called Badass Moms, which is a phenomenal anthology edited by Mary Fan. I've got a story in it uh, about, um, also urban fantasy, uh, about a woman who, who is a, a supernatural hunter for hire who works with her two teenage daughters. 
Uh, and it's full of all kinds of great stories about mothers who kick serious butt. So. Awesome. Maria, what are you up to these days? Well, it doesn't sound like I'm up to enough compared to Keith. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Don't judge. We're all slackers compared to Keith. Don't worry. Yeah. I've also given up such outmoded concepts as sleep. <laughs> she made him go last. Uh, Sorry. Actually, actually I, have, I have two series right now that have been um, that have been started to come out. Uh, the one series is a uh, science fiction. It's not an alternate history, but it's a science fiction series, basically where they discover terracotta warriors on other planets. <laughs> And <laughs> the reason I am such an expert in the Terracotta Warriors because I've always been fascinated with them. And so what I did is I put them on other exoplanets throughout the Milky Way galaxy. And of course, fast forward 400 years and we discover these warriors and we're like, well, why are they here? And then the next question is, who put them there? Uh, so that series is called the Sentinels of the Galaxy series. Uh, the third book, Defending the Galaxy, is coming out in November. The first book is Navigating the Stars, and the second book is Chasing the Shadows. So those three, that, that series will wrap up in November. And then I have a fantasy series that has come out. The first book has come out. It's very um, traditional fantasy. Uh, the Eyes of Tambiora sounds very fantasy. It's a desert world, and they all live in cities underground. And uh, they discover, it, it's a quest. The first book is a quest for these, um, these eyes that are precious stones that had the magic that if you have, if you possess these eyes, you have the magic to see into other people's thoughts and souls. So there's, of course, a couple factions trying to find it. And my main character is kind of caught in the middle of everything. And she's trying to help them, you know, find these, these eyes, these artifacts. So it's interesting because both my series have like archaeology in it. Uh, <laughs> it. It just kind of happened that way. I was shopping around both series and um, Harlequin Australia picked them both up. And they're like, yes, we want them. And I'm like, great, you know, six books, six years. But they were like, no, six, six books, three years. So I've been working <laughs> on these for the last three years. And I'm finally writing the third book in the, 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 it's called The Archives of the Invisible Sword. The third book I'm working on now. The second book will be out next year. And then the third book. So those, those are the two projects that I'm working on right now. Cool, thank you. And for something completely different, what do you have, TJ? Uh, absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, honestly, like uh, I'm a comedian, so most of the comedy clubs are obviously shut down. So I'm performing a lot on Zoom, doing Zoom shows, which is great and that's fun. I, I still love making people laugh, uh, but. I honestly, I've been releasing new music a long time ago. I used to do music, and so now I've been releasing new music. I go by, uh, I do hip hop, and my mother gave me my 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 rap name. So yeah, I'm pretty proud of that one. It's called Big Little Kid, and so I have a, yep, I ha I have a song, and it's not this is it's it's not it's nothing, you know, negative or anything violent. It is about a guy in his mid 30s that goes to brunch with his significant other and later on has intimacy and spends quality time. And the song has a saxophone in it because we're all adults. OK, that's what we're doing. That's what we do. Um, so and um, I do a small show, a uh, weekly show called Full Feather Friday that actually came about when I met your husband, actually. Like he was there for the inception for it. It's a show about birds. I, I came up with it about four years ago and brought it back in, in the midst of quarantine. And it's just me. I don't know anything about uh, birds, but I like I love to go bird watching because it's 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 relaxing and it's a way to enjoy nature. And so I just report about birds and I'm kind of make fun of the way that they look or their mating habits or or the food that they eat or just whatever. And um, I feel like you you. You, you all are so well-versed and great writers and doing all this cool stuff. And I, I, I keep, I'm like obsessed with like, like a nexus point. And I keep thinking about, and with all due respect, with Ron Goldman just didn't stop by N Nicole Brown Simpson's house that one night. And I think about that way too much, way too much. Like, Okay, way too much because, like, what if the OJ trial never happened? Like, 
you know, no Kardashians, like no Kanye, like really like Kanye would still exist, but no, but like reality so TV. Utopian TV. fiction you're talking about. that? <laughs> Like there was just so much. Like what? Like ah, yeah. uh, think about it. Just there, uh, TMZ wouldn't exist. Reality TV, um, the obsession with true crime, true crime. You know, so like, um, and I also think about what if Beyonce never existed, and I, that's just not a world I want to live in. <laughs> Next that's for that. I, it's just a, it's just a disaster story of me. Uh, you know, not, you know, I don't know. That's that's what I think about. But you guys are awesome. Um, that's that's really what I'm working on. This is fun. I'm just happy to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all been in our houses for too long. So now, uh, we love to talk to all of you. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us. Uh, if anybody has any questions about, oh, oh, I should probably talk about me. Um, so the reason. I'm here, <laughs> is because um, I didn't come out with a new book this year, sorry. Instead, we re-released uh, Steel Victory, which was my debut novel. Um, the shiny new version uh, has the author's preferred text, which basically means, means that I um, made my writing sound a little bit better than it did five years ago. Uh, and the new version also includes uh, bonus features. It has a short story about how two of the main characters first met. Um, it has a short nonfiction essay about the world that the book exists in, and it features a lovely foreword that made me cry the first time I read it by uh, award-winning author and editor Lee Murray. Um, and she talks about my cats, and she talks about my Tesla, and it's lovely. Um, and you didn't even have to read that. It's just gushing about me. But the rest of it's great, and you guys should all check it out. Um, the, the hardcover version officially came out today, which is why we're doing this. Um, thank you all for celebrating with me. And um, yeah, that's what I do is I, I'm getting ready to finish up the Steel Empire series. I have one book left to write. I'm going to start launch that into that um, tomorrow, I guess. I was giving myself until today to not think about it. So yeah, it's on my to-do list for tomorrow. Uh, start book seven. Oh, wow. um, and other than that, uh, lots of book reviews up on jlgribble.com because that's all I've done this year is read. Um, I'm at over 115 novels so far this year. Um, yeah, I'm on track for at least 200 this year. Uh, life is crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, other than that, I hang out with my cats and play lots of World of Warcraft because I started, I joined back in February and that was like the best thing I could have done for 2020 and I didn't even know right. it yet. And uh, so that's what I've been up to. And now we'd love to chat with you if any of you have questions for me or any of the panelists about alternate history, about anything that they're working on, we'd love to hear from you. And I think John might pop in to help moderate if we need him to and he, might have some questions to lead us off. Hey, look there, John. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I'm digging it so far. I'm enjoying it. Um, and yeah, if you drop some like questions in the chat box here, um, just let us know. I'll read it off to the panelists, and they'll handle the answers. And uh, I want to see how many other fans are there out here for alternate world alternate history. I'm a huge fan of shows like Fringe or the German shows, The Dark yeah. and Counterpart. Um, I don't know if there's any fans of those shows here tonight, but um, we need yeah. to, I need to finish season three of Dark. I, I was having medical issues last month and I couldn't stay awake, um, but now I'm like awake in the evening, so uh, I'm waiting for Eric to be like, we need to finish Dark, um, now that we've finished all of Avatar The Last Airbender. So... <laughs> I need to go back and watch Avatar. I, I'm so backed up. I still haven't started season three of The Dark yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I don't know if... Okay, I see no dark spoilers here in the chat. <laughs> yeah, no dark spoilers. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> I've actually been binging... One, one, one of the many TV shows I've been binging since, since the apocalypse started uh, is The Flash, which actually deals with alternate history constantly. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, there's tons of time travel... Um, he, he, there's an entire season built around the fact that he changes history yep. uh, twice. <laughs> um, plus it, it, 
pulls in all the different parallel Earths and whatnot. Um, it's, Which I think it's funny that the that Supergirl is on a parallel Earth just because it started on a different television network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. And then it wound up on the same network. And Black Lightning's on another parallel. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I like that. I like I I'm, I I like the way they're they're uh, dealing with that. Um, it's it's been a lot of fun, um, and particularly seeing all the subtle differences between among the various Earths. Um, you know, the different holidays, the different customs, the different pop culture references. My favorite was just one throwaway line that, that Gypsy had where she refers to Luke Starkiller, mm. which was the original name George Lucas had for Luke Skywalker in the first draft of Star Wars. Wow. Really? Was just Star -Killer? Nice touch. I love stuff like that. Yeah. Didn't they bring that name back for the, like, the super um, Death Star? Star right, Killer Star base Killer base. Yeah. Or so, yeah. So, I'm seeing some questions coming in here. We have uh, David Brawley. Good to see you again. Uh, let's see. So, Nazis and Confederates are the most common big changes. What um, are the most common little changes that you have seen? Uh, a lot of common little changes that I often see are are usually stuff about the internet. Um, and, and I think, and I, I have this theory that it's because a lot of times books get written, but then they might not get published until like years and years later. So people are really afraid to like work with technology as much as they could because they're afraid of dating their work. And so, um, like that's my whole theory about why, uh, the main character in Jim Butcher's Harry Dresden books can't use, like has technology issues. Um, because he didn't want to date his work with like cell phones and stuff. Um, and so I often see changes in how the internet is used um, and how just like little everyday moments of technology are either there or not there. I think you also see a lot of people taking a cue from Ray Bradbury where it's something seemingly meaningless that winds up having a major effect, you know, stepping on a butterfly, basically. Yeah. And what, and what, yeah, you know, something minor and what effect that has. I actually, somebody, somebody asked a question about uh, alternate history and established worlds like Star Trek. I actually wrote an alternate history Star Trek novel uh, about 13 years ago. Um, and the turning point there was somebody else discovered the Bajoran wormhole before Cisco did at the beginning of Deep Space Nine, and it was, it was a Cardassian, and all, and the only difference is basically somebody decided to make a left turn, or in essence, you know, take a different course while being chased. Just a minor course change, and then they found the wormhole, and mm. that completely changes everything. Um, and that that I think that that's a fun thing to do is just take something that seems inconsequential, but that can just ripple forward yeah hmm. yeah absolutely okay anybody else i was trying to think of something that uh something like stirrups you know uh when they invented stirrups for the for your horse for your feet made a big difference in war especially with the mongols and things mm. like that uh for ha to have them not been discovered at that time or to have them been discovered earlier and what what that would have impacted so that's like a minor type of thing you know that you could have had that you can really think about and and, and play around with so that that made a okay. big change when they did discover that and started using them because now you can shoot arrows from horseback right mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know my lessons with timmons in uh, at Seton Hill University, <laughs> he's he's got a great uh, course on uh, warfare for writers, and you think about things like silly little things like that, but they had a big, the big impact on warfare. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, somebody asked. Oh yes, Kimberly. Ah, huh? hey Kimberly, how's it going? Uh, what are your thoughts on the intersection of alternative history and urban fantasy? I think it happens a lot just because of a function of 
Um, if something so dramatic in the world, such as the supernatural existing, it, you know, is there. Um, a great example, I think, is uh, like the Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. Mm -hmm. That always comes to mind in terms of uh, like, it's not even contemporary urban fantasy, but it, it, I always think of those books as urban fantasy, even when they take place in a historical period. <laughs> um, but just the idea that, like... Washington, D.C. is urban. That counts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you talk, think, like, a, a lot of urban fantasy gets pigeonholed into, like, contemporary time, but the idea of urban fantasy is that it just takes place in a city, as opposed mm -hmm. to a lot of traditional and epic fantasy um, were... Uh, like, you know, you think of Lord of the Rings, you don't really think of cities, so. I do. <laughs> well, there's... Um, Hobbiton is totally a city. Yeah. Hannah, you mentioned before Alana Andrews and her, her one series with the um, primes mm -hmm. and everything. Well, she has another series that's urban fantasy where it's set in Atlanta, Georgia, and what happens is the magic has come back. Uh, and they have magic waves and then technology waves. So like during the magic waves, uh, tech, technology doesn't work. Like the cars won't run, the phones don't ring, you know, and everything. And the buildings start to, to get, to start to deteriorate. And so that, I thought that was an interesting uh, urban fantasy with mixed with sort of an alternate history because the alternate is that instead of being like a normal city, they now had all of a sudden got magic appeared and creatures appeared and, you know, werewolves and everything and the whole how the society. And it, it's one of those alternate histories that it, like it's an urban fantasy that doesn't even look like an alternate history on the surface um, yeah. until you understand the whole premise of the world that she's built um, and that like the world kind of swings between magic and technology and yeah. when the swing happens, all this craziness happens. Right, right. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good series. Um, it's, they call it the Kate Daniels series. Yeah, so the Kate Daniels series by Ilona Andrews and also her Hidden Legacy series, which are the ones with the super romancy covers. Um, yeah. Some of the best, them. some of the best urban fantasy out there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I even like their On the Edge series. Oh, yeah, those are good, too. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> book club. You turned into a book club. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Uh, Diane Williams. Hey, Diane. Uh, let's see. She says, how important is it to get all of the historical facts right or changed in a Nexus piece? I'm writing something, and it's constantly taking me down rabbit holes that are taking me away from the main story. Can I ignore some things? Ostrich out. It's important when you're doing research for any kind of research you're doing for fiction to know as much as you can. And yes, you're gonna find yourself going down rabbit holes and that's part of the fun. The trick is not to let it all, you don't need to put it all in your story. You just need to all have it in your own head for, for the creation of the world. Um, and, and the hard part isn't so much the constantly going down rabbit holes. It's then taking those rabbit holes and putting it all in the fiction because, oh my God, this is cool. You got to see this, but it has nothing to do with your story. Mm. Um, you you got to make sure that the only details that you include in the story are the ones that are important to the story. Um, for alternate history, you want to make sure you're thinking through everything you're doing and making sure that all your ripples track with, with what's happening. Um, and it can, it can, yes, you'll find yourself down lots and lots of, of rabbit holes, but th they're necessary. Um, you just got to remember to crawl back out of them at some point and, and actually write the stupid story. And depending on the story that you want to tell, um, you can probably keep some basic assumptions about the society that you're living in the same, um, depending on the time period or whatever. Like, not just... Things change, but I mean, it's also true that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So people are always going to be people. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Yeah, I always say that for world building, you only really need to show what, what you know, the main character is is influencing the story and, and what they're going, going through. I know, though, if you do have something historical and you're using it, keeping it 
like uh, the Napoleonic Wars with Naomi Novik. You know, she had done all that research on, you know, and she made sure that was right. All she did was add dragons to that situation. And that's a cool, that's a cool book too. I have to recommend that one too, uh, to the mix, to the equation. But if she had gotten anything wrong with the actual history of those wars, even though it's a fantasy, people probably would have called her out and said, oh, no, no, that's not how it went. So, so you, you do need to know, you need, need to have that information correct if you're keeping it the same. Unless you're blatantly making it an alternate history of right. because right. there are dragons, this changed. Right. So, right. Yeah. But the rest of the war, she kept pretty much. Yeah, which is cool too. Historical figures accurate, and she did, you know, all that stuff. And I was really impressed by that. And um, and then how and to fit in these dragon uh, units into a, a war situation, I thought that was really well done. We're just doing everything we can to avoid angry emails. Yes. <laughs> well, or we'll still get them anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why I write fantasy and I don't set it in any time period. Then nobody can tell me that they didn't use this certain word uh, in that time period. Because there are. Oh, it doesn't help. They send angry emails anyway. Yeah, they they have such experts, you know. Um, about things and like, well, they never use this word in, you know, 1378. I'm like, it's a fantasy world. You know, it's my world. They use that word in my world. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to an author of Westerns and he was going on about all the bar scenes in Western movies being wrong because the bar stool was not invented until a certain year and all these things. And I was like, wow, okay, this is, this person is really, you know, way too into it, but okay. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Okay, we've got Lauren who asks, do you usually start with something you want to change or do you think of a current timeline change and work backwards to what could cause it? I definitely use the latter. Um, I tell the story that I want to tell and then I figure out how to justify it. <laughs> um, and that's led me to some, some fun things. Um, uh, and I think it, it boils down to what kind of writer you are in terms of whether you're a character or a plot driven writer. Um, I'm a ca very character driven writer and I think about the situations that I want to put my characters in and then I work everything else around that as opposed to um, I'm sure other writers are more event driven and oh I had this you know this great idea for an alternate history now let me figure out the story that I want to tell to show it so it really depends on what type of writer you are and um my favorite refrain is there's no one right way to do it so right. do what works for you uh for me like I know I'm a I know I'm a comic but as as a comedy writer I work a lot backwards you know and so because like I going back to what I said about OJ uh just like I was trying to keep up with the Kardashians and I was just like, why, why are they, why are they famous? And I, and I, I got, I just did, you know, and started thinking about it. I was like, really? It just came back to that point, you know? And then I was just, and so you, there's no, you know, long story short, there's no wrong way to approach it. it it's just some people work backwards. Some people, um, uh, and or just they just think of a prop. Some people are just you know you can read an angry email and then you can think of something that you want to change. The the I have found that the answer to almost every question about the writing process is it depends. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I mean, the most angry email that I've ever gotten was somebody who was mad that I had a wear badger. So one of the only major changes that made it into the new version of Steel Victory is that now there is also a wear porpoise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't get angry emails. I just get ones that are like, you know, correcting, you know, like, I mean, like, did you know, uh, somebody didn't think you could live in the trees. I had a, uh, in a, I had a jungle and the people in the jungle, they all lived in the tree canopy instead mm -hmm. of on the ground. Cause it was wet, you know, moisture and stuff. And they're like, you can't do that. Like that's impossible. And I was, I didn't correct her that. Yes, you can have, <laughs> of course you can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but it was like, oh, thank you for emailing me. You know? I mean, it needs to be a fairly substantial tree, but still. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's yeah. It gets, it does depend on how you, how what do you want your story to focus on? Is this some cool new uh, society that's based on a change in history that you want to showcase? Uh, then you would probably work from the change in history to the forward to the society, or is it a character who is in this society? And then you would work back to find out, like like Jay said, work back to find out well what triggered this path that the, the society took, you know, things like that. Um, what what caused it to go go in a different direction? So yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. I don't know if we have any other questions coming in here. We do have a couple of interesting comments. Somebody talking about uh, Supernatural as alternate history, the TV show Supernatural. And also David Rank mentioned Eagle in Exile Trilogy. Rome invades North America in the 13th century, and the Native Americans have mastered non-powered flight. That's cool. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, uh, people are talking. People are really into the weird porpoise. <laughs> now they're talking about weird toads, weird hamsters. Oh you really God. want to read your book? You can go so. on with that. <laughs> the only reason that it's a porpoise is because I needed. I, I had to find an animal with a terrible sense of smell. And then I discovered that Google really doesn't understand when you're trying to ask it like what animals can't smell because they really just want to tell you about pets that don't cause odors. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Of course. So speaking of research rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That could be a whole nother session on, on researching and how much of your world building, how much of the information that you have should go on the page. Because yeah. You do find some cool little aspects and you want to include them in uh, but then the story doesn't really support it. I had a student, Seton Hill student. She did all this research on ancient Egypt. I mean, she knew she is the expert in ancient Egypt and everything. And and she tried. She started her novel five different times with five different characters and five different aspects <laughs> of this world because she was just so excited to show off this ancient Egypt world that she had all this knowledge about. And I was finally like, no, pick one. <laughs> Pick one character and show the world through her eyes as she goes about her day. Don't just dump all this information about ancient Egypt in it. Show it to the reader as she interacts. And um, and, and she finally did. I thought she finally got a good focus and came out with a, a really good fantasy novel. So I was, I was very, I was proud mentor, proud mama at that time. All right. Well, unless we have any other questions coming in, um, we'll probably transition over to the expo area and networking sessions pretty soon. Um, but we'll give people a minute to, you know, put their thinking caps on first to think of any other questions. I was wondering if you had to give people one piece of advice for writing alternate history, uh, one thing that you would hope they would take away from this, what would it be? Um. Based on certain events that have happened in 2020, um, my current major kick is uh, write stories that don't default to the world being more terrible. Um, often the, the, the Nazis winning World War II and the South winning the Civil War is kind of an excuse to write about a darker world where slavery still exists or, you know, genocides have gotten even worse. Um, so my hope is that people thinking about writing alternate histories uh, use it as an excuse to, you know, hopefully create a little bit of a better world because we need to read about stuff like that right now. Right. And also to be careful about uh, cultures and, and not to misrepresent them. I mean, because uh, I think that's really important, especially like not twisting them and making them worse, especially if it's not, you know, your own history. So I think that I think that's a very sensitive subject right now for writers have to be very careful about, you know, the culture, because I know we mentioned a lot about Native Americans, because in the history, you know, they're a big part of our history and, and to not to take the stereotypes and not to go and 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 uh, show their 
their culture in a bad light or in a, be inaccurate. So. I think it's also important, and this isn't something we really touched on, but it's a, it's an important thing to remember. It's very easy to get caught up in the, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? But don't forget, you also have to tell a story. There needs to be an actual story with a beginning, a middle, and an end with interesting things that happen to characters you give a crap about. Um, you can't lose sight of that while you're having so much fun coming up with the diagrams of how things branched out from and what things are the same and what things are different. Um, and this is and this is true of, of speculative fiction in general because you, because the one thing about science fiction and fantasy is that it's even even traditional without alternate history. It's still you're still creating a world. It's the only genre in which the setting is not real. Um, and to some extent, any kind of uh, speculative fiction, you are creating the setting, even if you're not doing an alternate history. And when you're doing that, you have to make it interesting, but you also can't lose sight of telling your story. All right. Let's see. I would say, looks like we have a couple more questions that did come in. Let's see. Uh, what's the most interesting research rabbit hole that you love but haven't gotten into your book? I still have yet to actually work into fiction one of my favorite things from history, which is the disastrous effect that the 19th century introduction of the bunny rabbit into the Australian ecosystem had. <laughs> I wrote an essay about, I found out about it when I visited Australia in 1999, and I just thought it was the coolest thing, not entirely cool for the, yeah. for, you know, but, um, but it was a fascinating thing because rabbits have no natural predators in Australia and they breed like, well, rabbits. And so they completely overran Australia and it's still a problem. Yeah. yeah. That, that was good. Oh. And it was just because some British aristocrats wanted to hunt. Yeah. Um. I, I've spent a significant portion of the last 20 years um, researching UFOs. And uh, I, I think I'm probably the only science fiction writer who's just really excited to finish the sprawling, epic, urban fantasy mess that I'm working with and write just a solid near future science fiction story <laughs> where things are pretty much the same, um, but there's, there's UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. I do a lot of research, and I but they usually all get in my book somehow. I'm trying to think of. I mean, I even I even did a um, I did a visit to one of our uh, direct jails, a maximum security correctional facility, and that even made it in into my book. I think I think everything that I do or experience, at least some part of it, gets into a story somewhere, and it always surprises me sometimes when I'm writing when it'll just kind of bubble up and it'll come out on the page. I can't think of anything that I'm like, I mean, I really enjoy photography and into that, but I don't, I think I had one short story where the main character was a photographer, but I don't know. I, I, if I when I find things that are interesting, I, they, I managed to get into books somewhere. <laughs> All right. How about you, Jay? Anything that uh, you've looked into that you thought about putting into your comedy that you said at the last minute, ah, oh, no, that doesn't work. You still want to try it someday? I can't hear you. Uh oh, I think we might have lost your sound there, Jay. Oh, no. Jay is, Jay is quiet. There is no Jay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody stepped out on a butterfly in 1930, and now and now Jay can't be heard. Yes. Stuck in here. Oh no! What is going on here? Uh, hmm. Well, while we try and figure that out, well, Jay, Jay, which Jay is beaten by technology once again. Oh. Yeah. Oh dear. Jay's never going to do any stuff for me anymore because all his technology always works. And then the second I ask him to do something, everything falls apart. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Well, we'll come back to Jay. Let's see. Uh, I think we, we did have another question in the meantime. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. <laughs> 
Or was there not another question? Hmm. Maybe there's not. Jay asks, am I stuck in the computer? <laughs> <laughs> he got sucked in. He's, he's, he's trapped in the mirror. Oh, no. <laughs> he's in the upside down. OK. Yeah, well. yeah. I was going to mention that series, Stranger Things. That yeah, right. 1985. Yeah. I, I've recently been binge watching that one. Um, um, my daughter told me about it and like I've been writing two books a year so I haven't watched much TV but she like pretty much sat me down and turned the TV on and, and forced me to watch it <laughs> but I've done all three seasons now nice. I still haven't seen it oh, worth it I recommend it uh oh, oh and we've lost Jay completely okay I think he escaped from the computer okay <laughs> yeah. well, well that's probably a good thing I guess yeah Okay, well, uh, on that note, oh, oh here, here he comes. Hi, Jay. <laughs> no, oh, he's he's here you. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I think we'll have to sign off on behalf of Jay. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for coming and helping me, Jay. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate uh, Keith and Maria and John taking the time. And I also really appreciate everybody signing on to watch my cool presentation. And hopefully uh, the world will go back to normal and I'll be doing this at conventions and you guys can all come participate live. Um, when I do this live, everyone in the room gets to do the fun interactive part. Um, and we've done all sorts of cool uh, crazy stories. Um, and thanks so much for coming and celebrating uh, the relaunch of Steel Victory 2.0. And um, check it out. And there's four more books after that. And uh, hopefully we'll be back on schedule next year with book six, which is actually already totally drafted. So. All right.